Hey golfers, and welcome to another episode of the Second Swing Thoughts podcast. And today we actually have a two for one. Uh, we've got two guests with us today. Um, we're going to start by breaking down the PGA Championship a little bit here with Pierce Lanou. Pierce, uh, of course, writes the Sunday Swing for us on SecondSwing.com, recapping the weekend's action in professional golf. And then later on as well, we have uh, Osti Rollinson. Um, we actually recorded that one live on our YouTube channel, uh, reviewing the Scotty Cameron Phantom 2024 putters. And so stay tuned for that conversation as well. Osti dives in really deep on the Scotty Cameron Phantom lineup this year. So, uh, but first, Pierce, we're going to start with the PGA Championship. Uh, we always try to get together and talk about the major events. And um, certainly this one was a major event. And it felt in a way, though, like it was sort of the birdie fest of a a regular tour event in a sense just because of how great the players played and how low the scores were and the conditions were so soft and perfect for scoring so we saw a lot of birdies out there yeah yeah i feel like uh pga championships kind of turn into one of those i don't know i just feel like it's always kind of turned into a slug fest yeah just all the best players making making a bunch of birdies and, mm-hmm. and shooting low scores and it seems like specifically like the weekend rounds always there's always just like five or ten guys just kind of accelerating yeah and and just shooting like 64 65 yeah. on the weekend something similar to that yeah just i mean super low the course at Val, well, valhalla this weekend was certainly you know i think people are kind of looking at the scores themselves and they're saying well why why are the scores this low i don't want my majors you know i don't want my wager winners to be shooting 20 under par you know i want the major winners to shoot four or five under par right but i look at it in the sense of i want the best players to be at the top and pj championship for a long time now has produced really really good leaderboards in the sense that you have star power at the top all the time i mean here you had you had Xander Shoffley, you had Bryson DeChambeau, you had Scotty Scheffler in the mix, you had um, Colin Morikawa in the mix. You had the guys that are stars of the game up there, and that's been the case. You look back to last year, you had Brooks and Hovland duel it out on Sunday with McElroy in the mix. The year before that, you had JT and Zalatoris in that playoff. I uh, mean, before that, it was obviously the Mickelson and Kepka year. Mm-hmm. So there's a certain, there's something about the PGA championship every year it, to me, if you look at how the majors have played out the last four or five years, the PGA has brought the most exciting Sundays um, looking back. So I, I appreciate that about the championship. You can say what you want about the low scores, but um, I was very fascinated all Sunday. It was great theater. And for a long time, you didn't know if Bryson was going to come out on top. Hovland was in the mix. And then of course, Xander who had been playing so yeah. well all year was able to make that one last birdie on 18 to get it done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I was kind of hoping for a playoff, like a three or four man yeah. playoff. Maybe because like, they also do the aggregate three hole right. deal. Yeah. So that would have been really fun. See a showdown of like Bryson, Hovland, yeah. Xander. That'd be fun. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, in the end, you know, Xander, he, he had that six. I think it was about six feet to to win the yeah. championship. And um, you know, I was watching. I I got to tune in for the last you know ten twenty minutes, and I was watching with some people, and, and they're all like, "He's gonna miss this putt." Yeah. And I was just like, "No, I I feel like he's gonna make it. Like it just seems like uh, it seems like it's it's past time that yeah that that he won one of these things. So yeah, uh, it was uh it was the perfect length of a putt where the narrative of his career has been that he can't close mm-hmm. and that putt right there of that length is like the perfect length where that narrative would only have been strengthened yeah. if he had missed. Um, so kudos to him for making, I think now too, that'll give him another edge, so to speak on Sundays when he's in for the mix sure. again, um, because obviously this year, I think he, before this event had had eight top tens, um, in 12 events, which is awesome golf, but he hadn't won anything and he yeah. had been up on the leaderboard. He'd been at the top, you know, in big events to the players um wells fargo obviously he was up there and so now he closes it out finally um and gets that win and i do have his list of clubs here i wanted to make a couple comments on it but um we always like to talk about the winners clubs especially at a major um the paradigm ai smoke triple diamond driver and paradigm ai smoke triple diamond three wood mm-hmm. in the bag callaway apex uw the utility wood which is a our our feedback on that has always been awesome yeah um, it's almost like a fairywood and a hybrid together and it yeah. just has a an insane 
pop to it they're off sweet. the club face. Yeah. I don't have one, but I've hit them, and they're, yeah. like, super fun to hit. Yeah, I mean, there's – we've had, you know, you try that 17-degree model and you make it stronger, yeah. it can absolutely play like a three-wood for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that thing is – it's a rocket. Uh, the Apex TCB irons, which is – they're not super widely available, and they never really mm-hmm. were. But um, John Rom, yep, John Rom, still play I think those. He, I think he does still play them because I know um, that's kind of. I think those are the irons he used when he was winning all those, yeah, all those tournaments the last couple of mm-hmm. years, the majors and and whatnot. Yeah, they're. Yeah. I think the TCB stands for Tour Cavity Back. Um, so I just you know I think it's another example of a tour player at the highest level still wanting a little bit of forgiveness there in mm-hmm. the irons um the wedges you got a callaway jaws raw 52 degree and then you have sm10 56 and then i think one of those wedge works proto 60 degrees yep. and then that <clears throat> that trademark red odyssey two yeah, line las I vegas know. putter that he's been using for some time now um and he has been a really good putter too. Oh it's yeah, been, he's been awesome. So he's a great. Um, putter. I don't think he'll stray from that model anytime soon. Yeah, either. that's kind of the trademark. You see Xander, and he's he's had that putter for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got that kind of crosshand uh, mm-hmm. set up for him as well. So I don't, you know, I was kind of I was really convinced. And again, this this happens in golf, right? Like a guy like Scheffler will get hot, and you're thinking, geez, how is he going to lose? And you think start thinking we talked i think a little bit about grand slam and mm-hmm. if that's going to happen with him um and we'll talk about Scheffler maybe a little bit later but um shoffley is a guy i think that definitely will contend and probably win another one at yeah. some point um he's been already in the mix so much in majors uh-huh. um and now that he's got one he's closed the door on one i think he'll you know might not be this year mm-hmm. but there'll be another time where he yeah the right week comes because he's been playing this is kind of the peak of terms of consistently finishing high in events i don't i would you'd be tough it'd be tough to find another stretch in his career where he's played this good for sure yeah i think he's one of those guys that like he just needed to get the monkey off his back yeah. now he's got you know the pressure's off going forward you know to get that first major because he's always been one of those guys recently at least that's been talked about as like you know when's he gonna do mm-hmm. it he keeps knocking on the door um kind of makes me think of like that that i don't it's not a meme but it's like that visual of like the miner you know he's mining and he's mining and he's yeah, mining i know what you're talking about he's and you know in one of the visuals it's like shows him he stops and turns around and yep. then but like if you would have just kept going right on the other side, it was yep. like the diamonds. Yeah. And it's just like, that's kind of what it feels like for Xander. He's just been getting so close. Um, now that he's broke through though, I think, I definitely think he's going to win more. Yeah. I, 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 I see him winning a green jacket. He's come so close mm-hmm. at Augusta multiple times. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think he's going to play with a lot of freedom and he's probably going to be, is he number two in the world now? Did I see he that is. correct? He did get to number two, highest rank he's ever been. It's surprising um, that he passed Rory, especially with the back-to-back wins. Like yeah. that just that just shows you how like consistently he's been placing high on leaderboards. Yep. Yep. I mean, it's he's been up there, and uh, I mean, again, eight top tens and twelve events prior to the PGA Championship is no joke. And yeah. so that's the thing with Rory is he had these couple wins, but also he hadn't really been placing yeah, that well before Yeah, he hadn't well done much that. else. So, so uh, yeah, Shoffley, you know, <clears throat> fantastic week for him. And I think what, to me, what was the difference is so on Sunday, on 10, he had kind of a weird bogey on the par 5, and then immediately yeah. responded by stuffing an iron on the par 3 and making birdie. And so that, that to me, kind of, as when I was watching it, I... I kind of thought at that point he was, it was his tournament to lose. Mm-hmm. And I thought because of the way he responded there, that would be enough. So um, kudos to Xander. Um, he, we've always I've kind of held him in sort of this major championship regard, yeah. just of how consistent he's been. And you look at like odds boards, he's always towards the, the shortest odds. And so um, now to see him get one is obviously yeah. very cool. So We're probably looking at a Hall of Fame career now. Yeah. I mean, Olympic gold medalist. Olympic gold medalist, major champion. He's a Ryder Cupper. He's. Yep. He's kind of done just about everything you can do mm-hmm. in golf. I mean, I'm sure he probably wants to win a lot more yeah. tournaments. Um, but yeah, he's he's you know he's in the prime of his career. He's got he's got a chance to have a pretty special mm-hmm. career. Obviously, he already has. But yeah, yeah, um, it'll be so, more for Xander for sure. So we we got to also talk about Bryson Shambo. Um, 
you know, I think you could argue the most entertaining figure in golf right now, whether you like him or you don't. Um, he brings a certain element of entertainment to any event he plays in, and especially these majors where you got, you know, the best in on both tours, so to speak, that are playing. Um, and Bryson, he certainly brought everything in that regard this weekend. Um, I, I mentioned this with, um, we kind of recapped Augusta and I mean it still like him being in the event, especially in the mix is just way more fun to watch. Um, the way, you know, he, on the back nine Sunday, he's ripping a driver at 196 miles, ball miles an hour ball speed. And then he's hitting a six iron from 243 to like three feet. Um, nobody else is doing that. Mm -hmm. Nobody's even going to try that. And so there's, I'll, I'll always be sort of grateful for what Bryson brings. Um, you know, whether, again, whether you like him or or not as maybe the the personality that he, um, that he, you know, presents himself with, I guess, um, it's so much more fun to watch the tournament. And so, uh, what it, it, he brought a lot of fireworks to Valhalla and, uh, I was, in a way, I was hoping for the playoff because that would have been a really a fun sure. treat to watch Xander versus Bryson square off there. Yeah, yeah, he's like the he's like the real life Happy Gilmore. Like, yeah, there's like a large group of people that like want him. They just don't want to watch him. They're yeah, like, kick him off the tour. Obviously, he's not on the tour, but yeah. Um, but those same people are also just yeah. infatuated with what he's doing. I mean, you can't, right. you can't not be just glued to the TV yeah. when he's. You know, it's and again, fun to we watch. Could, yeah, we could talk about his iron loss and that whole thing. You know, I know people are up in arms about that. Right. And I'm kind of one of them, to be honest. But the golf traditionalists. Yeah, uh, but he certainly is not a traditionalist guy. Correct. He's going to do what he wants, and he's he's really knocking on the door of another major. Yeah, he's become kind of a major threat again in these in these major championships. I mean, we saw him win the U.S. Open and. Uh, was it 2020 mm-hmm. or 2021? 2020. 2020, and then he didn't really do much after that in majors, it seemed like. Yeah, he kind of, that's kind of when things started to, you know, because he got really big yeah. and strong, and yeah. he won that U.S. Open by just brute force. He won force. that U.S. Open, and I was like, I genuinely thought he was going to win, like, <laughs> it seemed like he was going to yeah. win every major after that. Um, and then he kind of disappeared, and then it seems like since he's gone over to the Live Tour... Like his major performances have been trending yeah. in the right direction again, and you know we just saw him at Augusta. He came close there, and uh, now with the PGA, so two for two this year on on really being in contention on Sundays. Yep. And I know he played well in the majors last year too, which was kind of yep. a surprise to everyone. Um, but he's yeah, he's been doing it for for a while now. So mm-hmm. yeah, and he's also got the most electric what's in the bag, yeah, or, uh, clubs in the bag. You got to think he'll be one of the favorites at at the U.S. Open coming yeah. up. Yeah, so. um, he'll be he'll be up there. I think he'll be talked about a lot. He's got crank Formula Fire Pro driver at six degrees aloft, um, and then he follows that up with a TaylorMade Burner Mini driver, eleven and a half. So he's kind of playing a driver and sort of a two wood. It's basically um, another driver. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Uh, he's got another crank Formula Fire Five wood. Um, then he's got his prototype irons. That so Avoda prototype irons that are 3D printed, and I remember if you remember before Augusta, they got cleared by the USGA mm-hmm. or I guess um, on the conforming, conforming list right before yeah. the event, and the whole thing with those is the 3D printed face, and then obviously we talked about the lofts being insanely strong. Uh, I I remember looking at his sheet from a couple years ago, and his I want to say his seven iron was like 26 degrees, and his six iron is. Or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Eight iron is thirty degrees, maybe. I can't remember exactly what it is, but basically, his lofts are like two clubs difference compared to what most tour pros are playing. Yeah. Um, but he says it's because he just generates so much swing speed and so much spin that he's got to can be able to control it, which does make some sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ping glide four point wedges, and then that sick pro uh, C series arm lock putter. So um, he's got, and as as we mentioned, I mean that's the definition of sort of doing things your way yep. and however it works. So he, he made a, in his kind of uh, post tournament comments, he made a note or a nod to his equipment saying like, he's got his stuff dialed in now and yeah. um, clearly it's working for him. That's what's so f- like great about golf. It's like, there's no one, there's no one like right way to do something, you know, whether it's your swing or your equipment or your, you know, whatever it might be, it's all kind of, 
whatever you like mm-hmm. and whatever feels good to you and whatever's comfortable, just go with that. And, you know, you don't see every, every guy out there in the tournament has a different setup in their bag. Yep. So it's just, it's cool to see the different ways that these guys look at it and approach the game and, you know, build their, <laughs> build their, their clubs to their yeah. liking. It's, it's, it's fun. Yeah. yeah it's always, you, you'll get some fun quirks from everybody and then Bryson's just got like every everything in this bag is kind of yeah. a, is a fun quirk so a um, couple other notes here that just to hit on that um, I wanted to make sure we mentioned um, Victor Hovland we talked about him a little bit really struggled all year and even in like comments with the media beforehand just didn't even seem confident then he goes up there and he has a putt to tie for the top spot on the leaderboard on his final hole in the tournament mm-hmm. um ends up three putting it uh but regardless i think very positive showing for him obviously um as of february he was still playing i210 irons which is Mm -hmm. a lot of fun um those are now we're approaching seven years old i think on those yeah and so those things are still um you know a favorite among ping tour pros and i think you see a lot of them still being played just by non-staffers as well um a couple other things morikawa had a really good week striking the ball then just got really cold with the putter on Sunday, yeah. and I don't think he, I think he finally made a birdie on his last the hole. Last hole, yeah. And <laughs> so, and he was hitting the ball well most of the day. Yeah. Just couldn't quite get anything to drop. So yeah, another guy that's kind of trending in the right yeah. direction. And another big, good back-to-back major performances for for Morikawa. Yep. Um, Shane Lowry breaking the court, well, tying the course yeah. record at Xander set yep. 62. Um, just got really hot with the putter, made something absurd in feats of like yeah, 160 feet. Absolutely insane. Cause yeah. like he, like he genuinely is like one of the worst putters on the PGA tour <laughs> and like he's on the PGA tour, you know, he's yeah. a great golfer, but like he's consistently one of the worst putters like yeah. week in and week out. And then you see a round like that and you're just like, oh my goodness. And then I saw on Sunday, like his first holy stuff set to like four feet and misses the putt. I was just like, wow. Yeah. He's, water finding its level yeah, a little bit yeah because yeah. even when he won the the open in 2019 that was the thing is he led the field in putting yeah which was so out of character for him yeah so he he typically will finish well a lot of times because yeah. he strikes great, it well great ball he hits, striker he hits, yeah he hits fairways he hits yeah. great iron shots um so that was it was fun to see though when a guy gets hot like that mm-hmm. and, and just starts making bombs uh justin rose always he's been shifting equipment for yeah. pretty continuously for a couple of years now um, yeah he just randomly out of nowhere like turns back the clock 12 yeah. years and it's like you're watching him in 2011 yep. and he's just looks great i know but, it was yeah. frustrating at the Ryder cup last year because he didn't miss a putt yeah i think the entire week um and now this week he kind of lurked around never i don't think he really was challenging you know shoffley at the top I, yeah. I think he was I think he needed a, a couple point. more birdies to really be in that conversation sure. but to see him lurking on the leaderboard i think he earned himself a spot in the u.s open mm-hmm. with this performance um so i you know every time you think he's kind of on that back nine of his career and or he's gonna sort of fall off and and his um contending days are over he just shows yeah. up yeah and, still posting good finishes right and then lastly I, we can hurdle around some things with Scotty Scheffler here. We obviously have a lot of details that none of us, we don't really know, but I mean, what we know is there was some incidents. Mm-hmm. There was, uh, you know, we, we've seen all the news with Scotty Scheffler and, and everything, but the yeah. guy has three out of four rounds this week that are fantastic, regardless of the circumstances. Um, yeah, didn't have his caddy Ted Scott for Saturday. And that, that was, was obviously the one, the, one, round, the but, one bad round. So yeah. Uh, maybe Ted's asking for a raise this week. Uh, but regardless to see Scotty kind of fight those things off and still finish top 10 in a major, not, I'm not, not that I'm surprised, but it just shows kind of, you know, we were talking with Mark Brooks, um, we were down in Texas with him and he mentioned how he's got golf in the right place in his life. And yeah. that certainly is the case. If you can kind of lock in and, you know, block all the other stuff out and yeah. still play three fantastic rounds, you know, I think he had a 67, a 66 and a 65, this week so um he turns that 73 into something that's 67 or something like that you know he's he's right in the mix on yeah. sunday again yeah i thought he was gonna win the tournament after the friday round yeah after all the stuff that that happened and for him to go out there and just shoot 66 and i think he was maybe two back going into the weekend yeah but definitely liked his chances and then you know he had 
Ted Scott had to had to miss the Saturday round. I think it right. was, he said it was like his daughter's graduation yeah. or something like that. And yeah, and then Scotty just kind of struggled on on Saturday. He had mm-hmm. that stretch. I think double bogey, bogey, bogey yeah. on to start like, in the, on the like front nine. Four so, over yeah. through like five or six holes. It was just like, what is going on? Yeah, <laughs> you're not used to seeing that from. The, the yeah. almighty Scotty Scheffler. Yeah, it was, so. it was weird, for sure. Um, so with that said, we'll kind of start to wrap up um, recapping this event, but we also want to kind of look ahead to Pinehurst just a little bit, the U.S. Open. Mm. Um, based on what we know now, do you have any, maybe give like a couple big names that you feel strongly will contend, then maybe, maybe give me a name that's not so, you know, not so popular that you think might be a sneaky favorite to to jump in the mix for sure um bryson dechambeau yep will zalatoris okay and xander i think are the three that i'm going to be watching closely as yeah. like my three favorites um someone kind of from back in the in the pack that i He's not even considered a sleeper anymore, I don't think, because he's so good, but he hasn't really won a big event yet is Sahith Thagala. Yeah. Which obviously he contended this week. I think he just struggled on Sunday, but um yeah, he's up to like twelfth in the world, they were saying on the broadcast. Yeah. I was like, I didn't even know that. Yeah. But he is playing so good. I just feel like he's a guy that is gonna win major championships. And I feel like the US opens kind of set up favors yeah. his game he hits it really far and uh can shape the ball and, and kind of really hit hit all the shots mm-hmm. which is what you need at a u.s open so um he's probably my guy from maybe a little off the top of the board that yeah. that i like but. yeah i like that kind of quartet of names that you read all off there um one that i'll add of course is is hovland with just mm-hmm. if he kind of figured this out allegedly went I think back to his old swing coach that sort of helped him yep. uh, kind of jump the rankings a little bit last year. Um, so maybe that'll help him. Another one I'm going to throw out too is Justin Thomas. Um, I know he had kind of that wonky year last year where he mm-hmm. really d- hadn't found anything and he had a pretty good finish this week. Um, granted, did, it yeah. was, you know, in his hometown and, and all that. But um, I also think at, at Pinehurst, there's a little bit of sort of creativity around the greens needed with the way that's laid out and sort of the you know the false fronts and mm-hmm. and then ways your ball can kind of just fall off the green a little bit and you're going to need a little bit of wedge creativity and i think that's J- jt's the first name i think of when someone who can kind of manipulate ball flight yeah. and spin with wedges so How about jordan spieth and well and jordan spieth is another <laughs> one um you think of those two guys right away mm-hmm. so uh that's also, by the way, I saw Spieth on that 13th hole at the PGA uh, went for it on yeah. Sunday. Did not go well for him, yeah. but with uh, Alejandro Toasty did it and made eagle. So, um, but yeah, so that's it, it's going to be a fun event. The Pinehurst is, I mean, the US Open is always a fun one, but yep. I think Pinehurst sets up really well, and I think it'll be a pretty fun one. Last time it was there, it was like it was Keimer by like eight shots. Um, yeah, that's I really right. hope that's not the case this time. I think we'll get a lot Probably more. Not. I think we'll get a lot more competition, a lot more um, drama for on sure. Sunday. So um, with that said, Pierce, thanks for joining here. Yeah. Uh, recapping the PGA, talking uh, clubs, talking best performers. Um, been great. And again, we'll, we'll do this around the U.S. Open time yeah. as well. So um, next up on the on the show, of course, is Osti Rollinson from Titleist. We're going to talk about Scotty Cameron Phantom Putters. We filmed it live on YouTube, but here um, we're going to replay it for this podcast episode as well. So stay tuned for that. And I'd like to introduce our special guest. It is Osti Rollinson. Osti is the Senior Director of Putter R&D for Scotty Cameron Putters. So, Osti, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, I know all of us here at Second Swing are just so excited about uh, this lineup of putters. So, uh, yeah, thank you for joining us. And I hope everything's going well for you here so far in 2024. It's going great. We've had a great reception to the new Phantom line, and it's going to be a great time to be able to talk to you and your viewers about them. Yeah, I, we've had a ton of, well, 
first of all, great feedback from the fitters as well. Um, doing putter fittings in our stores. Uh, can't say enough great things about that. You know, we'll, we'll talk about all the different tech and uh, uh, you know the new look and some of the things that uh, you and the team have uh, implemented into this putter series. But um, I got to ask right away, uh, what was kind of you know as we maybe kind of tease a little bit of what we're going to talk about today. What was kind of your favorite part about working with Scotty and working with the team and then developing this new lineup of Phantom 2024 putters? I think the most fun part, this is really the first project I started here about two years ago. And this was the first project that Scotty and I really worked on together, you know, starting back in January of 2022 when I arrived. Um, and I think it's just the, the collaboration part of it. I think I love collaborating with with great designers. Uh, I've been able to do that in my career uh, so far, and it was great to be able to do it with Scotty, with someone who I've admired for for a number of years from another mm -hmm. from another company, but to be able to work with him on these designs was, was a career highlight. Yeah, absolutely. That sounds, I mean, that's kind of like the goal, right? I mean, you think of that name, Scotty Cameron, and it's, it's, it's an iconic name um, in our sport and in our game. And so uh, it sounds like uh, quite an experience. And obviously, you guys have delivered some uh, excellent products here to talk about. So let's kind of dive right into some of those, those tech features and what really is driving the performance of these Phantom 2024 putters. And so, um, you know, I've got a couple models here with me that we can uh, discuss here. But uh, first of all, I just wanted to get your feedback on the the look uh, and what kind of, because that's kind of, I know a big push for you guys is uh, the new faster look to the Phantom 2024 putters. So uh, can you kind of talk about what went into that and, um, you know, what the purpose is of this new look? Well, faster is a perfect word to use because that's the word that Scotty used with me, that he really wanted these putters to have have a fast, streamlined look. Um, that imagery is really powerful, I think, in golf. And in, in putters, it gives you a lot of confidence looking at something that's kind of fast. And so, um, number one, that was, that was the, uh, the word he used for me. Uh, and the other aspect he really wanted to focus on was alignment in these designs. So. When designing mallet putters, that's a big reason why people move to mallets is to be able to get something that's that's easier for them to align. And with all the Phantom models, uh, that's something we wanted to design into these. And so the new feature on these that you'll see is this kind of angled chamfer off the top line, which forms kind of an arrow look. It gives that putter its fast look, but it also is a great alignment cue for, for all the putters, the 5, 7, 9, and 11, uh, to help the golfer line up a little better. Um, the other aspect that he really wanted to bring into a couple of these new designs is to have a, a solid crown. So if you look at the previous Phantom X line, they had all of them had pretty distinct top line to them, kind of like a blade design. Mm -hmm. um, we had a lot of tour players that gave us input wanting a line to go from the face all the way to the back. And so one of the first things he brought into my office was a Phantom X seven where he'd welded a plate to the top to create a crown hmm. a solid crown going to face to back and so that was kind of the impetus to both the the number nine that i have here in my hand and the number 11 to get that real estate going from face all the way to the back at that long alignment lines on both of those putters um, to work well with the aero type feature to make these super easy to line up yeah there's it's fascinating to see how far that those kind of alignment features have come in the industry as a whole, whether you're talking about the golf ball, you're talking about uh, the top of a putter. Uh, it seems like there's so much more kind of science and data behind having a, you know, well-executed alignment aid for golfers to line up. And you can certainly see that um, on the Phantom 2024 models. Um, another one, another piece I want to talk about too, was the uh, kind of this dual milled face technology. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I think there's we have probably a combination of you know sort of hardcore uh, you know really gearhead type uh, golfers watching this, and also probably some people that uh, might just be tuning in, uh, maybe looking for a new putter, not super dialed in at that point. Uh, so what would I guess if to both of those categories of golfers, how would you describe the dual milled face technology? Well, the dual mill, any sort of face milling on a, a all mill putter is a way you can tune sound and feel. So if you have a, like a soft mill that has uh, just really light machine marks, that'll be 
louder, give you more audio feedback than something with, say, a deep mill, which has really deep uh, grooves on the top of the putter. Uh, and we've had putters like that from soft mill, mid mill, which our previous Phantom line had, deep mill, which some of the older select models had, to give a really different sound and feel. So this one is a dual mill, which is the best of both a deep mill. So we start with a deep mill, and sometimes that can be pretty rough, um, and then do a nice cleanup pass. So you get the benefit of a deep mill sound, but the consistency of kind of a mid mill, soft mill on top of that to really give you the, the right amount of audio feedback and consistent feedback uh, during impact. Yeah, and it's because it's, you know, that, that feel and sound is such a, a kind of a finicky thing for some people. So I know that's kind of part of this is trying to please as many of those golfers as possible. Um, and uh, clearly there's some, there's some uh, technology and design cap components that are uh, kind of aimed at doing that for sure. So, um, and then speaking on that too, you know, we talked about the, that's kind of the construction part of it and also the materials too. Uh, I know the Phantom mm -hmm. 2024 putters are unique in that aspect as well. So can you maybe shed some light on uh, some of the materials? I know there's a couple materials for sure that are, are important uh, in these putters. Yeah, there's two main materials. So there's a 303 stainless steel, which the body and the face is made out of. Um, but because we're making larger footprint mallets, if you were to make it all out of steel, it would be way too heavy. And so that's where we bring in our 6061 aircraft aluminum, which on this putter, it's in black here, to be able to lighten up that center part, the sole part, to be able to distribute that weight in the perimeter of these putters to get the, the MOI or forgiveness up, um, while still having kind of a rich metal look of the whole putter. Um, and so when you bring in kind of the construction of it, that's when you got to be really cognizant of how these parts go together because you can put them together in such a way that that putter will sound very bad, very inconsistent. So we spent a lot of time looking at not only how we use the aluminum, but the thicknesses of the aluminum, how the parts are screwed together, putting damping materials in between the steel and the aluminum to get them to sound really, really good as an individual putter, we also we spent a lot of time looking at as you go from the five, seven, nine, eleven to make sure that sound is consistent because we have a lot of tour players, a lot of consumers that like to, I like the look of a, a of a five and a seven, but then I'm having a little more trouble with my alignment. I want something that gives me a little bit more of an alignment benefit, so I want to move to the nine and the eleven. We want to make sure that those putters sound consistent. And so we spent a lot of time looking at how these parts go together and and tuning those sounds. Yeah, it's uh, and, and and having tested, you know, uh, th those putters myself, and I've got the 11 model here. Uh, and it, I mean, it, again, like we talked about the alignment aids, and you talked about kind of how these materials kind of combine together. There, um, done a magnificent job of well, looking, making it look great for one, but then also in the testing too, that feel and sound component is very much tuned into an extremely high level there. So um, I'll give you the credit for that. And then I'm also, I know one of the key components, we talked at the PGA show um, earlier this year about um, how these, uh, this line of pyres will have a new grip. Uh, so we need to make sure we get that discussion in here and what these grips, you know, what what's different about them compared to maybe past models or past, I guess, uh, you know, the standard grips that uh, would come with the Phantom series in the past and what's different with this one now that golfers will uh, get the benefit from. Yeah, so the previous Phantom line had our Pistolero Plus, which was kind of Scotty's version of his Pistolini grip, a pistol grip, but with more of a, a flare, more of a, 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 a basically a, a paddle uh, feature on the, it just it was a thicker up the top. Um, Scotty loves that grip personally. That's the one he always puts on his putters. Um, but I wanted to bring something more into that's more of a paddle style grip. And so we had a, a grip years ago uh, called the Baby T grip, still widely used on tour, but it was more of a paddle style grip. So it had a, like a wider front, um, okay. flatter front on it. Um, but by today's standards, that's still a pretty slim grip. And so um, when I talked to Scotty about my ideas for what to do with this grip, he loved that idea. That was a very popular grip, still popular in the gallery um, for the custom shop. And so made it a little larger style grip, a little more parallel 
sides, like you see on a lot of the modern grips out there, um, but still has that Scotty Cameron pistol look. It's got the pistol kick on the upper part of the grip, but really looked at the dimension of this and made, looked at how we made the thickness of it from top to bottom, side to side, so that it fits the hands really comfortably. And that's why we call this grip the full contact grip. Um, we had Diane, Danielle Kang, who snuck one out early and used it all last season. And she commented how it just fits so well in her hands, she doesn't have these gaps. And so I think that really helps her to really control the pressure in her putting grip to keep a nice, even, consistent pressure to make a smoother stroke. And so that was the idea behind this. Specific for mallet type putters, you want kind of a larger style grip, get your hands on there with a light touch, but have a lot of contact so it stays in your hands. Yeah, and on that note, Asti, I kind of have a sort of follow-up question because I think we talk so much about putter technology, putter design, you know, the club head so, uh, a lot more so than really any other component of a putter. Uh, but I guess what is the importance of having a good, proper putter grip uh, for a golfer? You mentioned a little bit of it with, uh, with Danielle Kang and just how she felt like there wasn't any gaps in the grip. What kind of advantage does that give a player when they're out on the golf course? I think one of the things Scotty really says, uh, told me early on, was he really wants the, the, the style of the head to match the grip. And so I think someone who likes to look at a blade style putter, um, we pair that with our Pistolini grip, someone that has it a little more in the fingers, use a little more of the hands in the stroke. And so when you go into a mallet style putter, having a larger grip, they really want to go to that mallet style putter to simplify everything, have kind of a big motion shoulder turn. So you want to keep the hands kind of quiet and a larger sure. grip kind of helps keep the hands quiet out there. Um, and so that's why we decided to put this paddle style grip on there. So those players out on the course using that larger grip, I think it'll help simplify their strokes, take the hands out of it, employ the larger muscles, um, just to make their stroke more consistent. Yeah, definitely. There's, it's again, I, I, it's even something that I would admit myself. I don't really think too much about the grip aspect. It's more about what the putter head does. And then you talk more about kind of like toe flow and other elements of putters. But there's, again, this, this grip element that you guys clearly have put a focus on kind of offering something new and more comfortable for players. And um, I, I mean, again, having tested these a little bit myself, um, I think it, it, I agree with what Danielle Kang was saying. It just has a certain comfortability that um, maybe past grips didn't. And so um, with that said, I kind of wanted to actually, now that we've talked about some of the tech that's involved in each model, um, dive into the various models available in the 2024 Phantom series. So I know there's various head styles, um, you know, there's different neck styles as well. So I kind of, if you would, uh, if you would just run through each model, um, kind of briefly explain some of the features to it. Um, and then, uh, you know, our, our, and also of note, our, our viewers here can throw some questions or comments in there in the chat as well. Um, so we can kind of get some feedback from them. And then uh, again, of course, get your insight on each of these models. Sure, sure. Uh, so the first one I'll talk about is the Phantom 5. This is one of our most popular models that we've had in the Phantom X line. Um, it's a pretty simple shape. Uh, one of the things we've done on this new five that's different than the previous five is we simplified the profile a little bit. The previous one had kind of three facets on the side. This one has two. Um, simplify that shape. It's a little smaller in the, uh, in the profile. And I think that's something that's been really attractive to those tour players like Cam Young and Justin Thomas, who have already put this model in play, is they love that look, that little more compact look of this design. And then it's just highlighted with, there's no big tracer lines on it, but just the simple three dot alignment to show them where the center of the putter is. And this one, like, like our previous Phantom X line, has just the single top line on top. And this, what we find is those players that are migrating from a blade into a mallet putter, it's that familiar look of that top line that they may use to align kind of more of that perpendicular feature on the putter to the target line versus the, the parallel. Sure. So that's the Phantom 5, kind of a, a simple mallet with just uh, an indication where to put the ball. Um, next model is the, the Phantom 7. And so this is kind of that, that fang, traditional Fang style uh, design what we've done on this one differently for the previous seven, we've elongated 
rid of the fangs to get a little more uh, perimeter weighting on there, to let it make them a little longer, a little more real estate for those tracer lines that put on there that the players sure. that want that kind of perpendicular alignment with the parallel alignment. We found a lot of players like to use those tracer lines to align their body to the putter as well as the putter to the target line. So it's kind of a dual purpose there. Um, and then the other thing we did is move the, the sight lines that were in the aluminum in the previous model up onto the steel uh, to get a little more steel in the toe and heel to boost the inertia a little bit. And then it's got the simple three dot alignment on top for this one. Um, moving on to the Phantom 9. This is a brand new design for Scotty Cameron. Um, it's been a while since we've had these kind of uh, peekaboo holes through the head. Um, and this is when Scotty came specifically said, hey, I want a, a putter that has these kind of, he called them peekaboos through the, through the head. Um, use, and it still incorporates that kind of uh, arrow type alignment on it, like the five and the seven did. This one has, like I talked before, that uh, solid crown. So you can have the alignment going face to back. But those peekaboo holes allows us to keep this as a pretty compact shape, similar to the Phantom 7 in terms of its silhouette. But being able to put those holes, you get more weight in the perimeter of this design to get the inertia up in kind of a compact shape. This is available in both a uh, mid-bend shaft and a jet neck to give a little more toe flow, as is the 5 and the 7. And then finally, one that's launching this week into the market is the Phantom 11. This is the flagship model. It is the highest inertia, most forgiving. It also has the most overt alignment on it. And so what we did on this one, as opposed to the 9, which you saw had this, you know, those dual lines that went from face to back, we decided to bring in a, a, an arrow type alignment feature that Scotty was inspired by. And he was playing golf with a buddy of his who had one of the old holiday putters that had an arrow type feature on this. And mm. as we were designing these, he took a picture of it, sent it to me, goes, this is what we should do on, on the Phantom 11. And so we've modified it a little bit, made it look a little less decorative, a little more instructional and work really well with those uh, angled chamfers to really highlight that arrow feature make this super easy to align. And then this one's designed with these uh, wings on it. And when you turn it over, we've designed it almost like a weighted wing on the bottom. And that's there to kind of get that weight rearward at the toe and heel to get the sure. inertia up. But it's angled in such a way to make sure that the center of gravity doesn't get too deep. As you start chasing inertia in putters, which a lot of manufacturers do, you gotta be careful that the center of gravity doesn't get too deep because it starts working against you, makes it harder to release. And so we wanna make sure that this was forgiving, yet had a CG depth that was easy for this thing to release as well. And it also looks really cool on there yeah. as well. It definitely looks cool. Uh, I will, I will uh, definitely kind of uh, vouch for that that take, uh, having uh, toyed around with it myself. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about sort of the different neck styles and the different uh, kind of, I guess, toe flow to elements to these putters. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of just go over to, because there's five, there's 5.5. So kind of going through, uh, you know, what the toe flow does for golfers. Um, you know, if, I know it's somewhat related to kind of the stroke type or maybe the way a golfer might, uh, swing the putter, but uh, can you just kind of give the give us the basic backgrounds on on what that what toe flow really is, and um, I guess maybe what golfers uh, should be using those types of putters. Well, I think that the what that hosel does is it moves that shaft axis, um, the position of the shaft axis. So if it's more face balanced, like our five, seven, nine, eleven are, it's going to be more in line with the center of gravity. And as you start moving that shaft more heelward like you will on a 0.5 model the head kind of will move further away from the golfer so it helps get the eyes inside the ball a little bit so that's one thing where a lot of golfers some golfers will see the line better if their eyes are right over the ball a lot of tour players see the line better when their eyes are a little inside so kind of our newport newport 2 with our plumbing neck gets the eyes inside a little bit and the 0.5 necks do the same thing they also will move that center of gravity further from the shaft axis. So as they rotate it, they're going to be able to have a little bit more face awareness. So if you're the type of player that, that really uses the hands to kind of sense where that face is, 
having a 0.5 neck will kind of give them a little more face awareness as through their stroke. It'll also help kind of balance their motion with what they're feeling, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, that definitely is a good explainer. It's actually a different perspective than I've heard the most uh, from most, you know, putter designers in terms of what that stuff means, but it's a good perspective there in terms of, cause I haven't really heard this aspect of seeing the line better from, I guess, inside, but, uh, you know, you, I mean, if you're talking about tour players, uh, clearly they kind of have a good mm -hmm. idea of what they like to look at and what works for them at the highest level possible. Um, I wanted to make one quick note. We have someone in the, in the chat, uh, named Bruce, who said he's getting his 9.5 model on Friday. So, um, that's we just talked about the design into that one. Uh, that's a uh, certainly you know it's gonna kind of have those holes in the back of it too. So clearly something's going right with that design uh, in the new Phantom series here. Um, and then moving into the these long models, you have the 11 long, uh, and then we have another one here too that we'll we'll bring up in a second. But the 11 long model uh, new this week. What uh, there's this trend kind of going on here with with tour golf and players using longer putters uh, added some weight there. Between you and Scotty and the team there, what was that process like of of bringing a long model kind of to uh, to the golf space uh, at, at Mass, right? Where not it wasn't just kind of for the specialty tour player, you know, getting something out there where any golfer could benefit from it. Right. Well, it's kind of bringing it back, if you will, because yeah, I think when the when the USGA banned anchoring, uh, a lot of companies went to arm lock style putters and went to kind of counterbalance style putters. Um, Scotty Cameron had one called the dual balance, which at the time it was using a kind of a belly or mid putter type head, which is about 400 grams um, on a shorter shaft with about 38 inches, 39 inches. And then to counterbalance that heavier head, Scotty put a, a 50 gram weight in the butt end of the grip and then a longer 17 inch, 15, 17 inch grip on there as well. Um, I think when those initially came out, I think the those players that were a little twitchy um, wanted to take the hands out of it and use weight to take the hands out of it. On shorter putts, they work great, but I think they found quickly, especially tour players who are very sensitive uh, on longer putts, it's harder to control mm -hmm. distance. So we saw in the market and on tour, uh, those went lighter pretty quickly. And so you saw heads migrate from uh, 400 grams down to 375, 380 grams. And then the counterbalance is going from 50 grams down to 20, 10, or even sure. just using the grip as a heavier grip. And so that's what you're seeing today. We had a few players, some players that a lot of other tour players look to as that are good putters that kind of went to this design. So it got it hot on tour again. And so we were getting requests from tour players for this type of setup. Um, and so as soon as that happened, we said, well, we've got to bring it to market. Um, and that's where the fan of 11 uh, came from. And that's why it's in our line. Yeah, it's, it's clearly something that uh, as someone who has definitely experimented with that kind of longer added weight, uh, counterbalance style. Um, I'm really excited about the 11 as a possibility. And I know our fitters have already made uh, some great comments to me about uh, just the general interest. You know, a golfer goes into the kind of our putter fitting bay. They see a longer, you know, now faster looking, right, phantom uh, model, and it already catches their eye. And they get that thing in their hands with this new grip. And there's just, it's a completely different feel, but at the same time, it also incorporates a lot of things that have already been successful um, in some of these past phantom lineups. So uh, there's again, a ton of interest there. And then while we're on the topic of these longer putters too, we should also bring up right. The square back to uh, long one I've got here. Uh, so another kind of, uh, you know, addition to these long offerings, uh, what was kind of what sparked this new uh, offering uh, from Titleist there going to, you know, something smaller, obviously, and a different neck type as well. So what was what's kind of behind that one? Well, I think that as as we we're developing these long putters uh, for the Phantom line, you know, we chose the Phantom 11 because it's got the largest footprint um, and that would pair well, I think, with that longer uh, length of the putter, kind of the longer grip, the proportions all looked right. I think if you had like a big grip with a small head, 
the proportions would, wouldn't look right. And I think it may make golfers a little uncomfortable. And so um, when we were choosing what other model to put in, we immediately went to the square back too, because it's our largest blade that we have offered. Sure. And we didn't see a lot of uh, competitors look to that. We have a lot of uh, players on the LPGA tour that were using this square back to in a longer design. They weren't going 38 inches, but they were going 36 inches. But the setup was similar, having you know a heavier head, a little bit longer than shaft that they would usually use, and then a longer grip. And so we decided the square back two would be a great offering to put into the the super select line to kind of complement what we're doing on the phantom line. And so the super select, what we did is put two 25 gram tungsten weights in here to get that head weight up to 375, which on a blade, traditionally our blades are a little lighter than our mallets are. And so the phantom has two 25 gram tungsten weights, bringing it up to 380 grams and then 136 gram 17 inch grip to kind of counterbalance that extra weight. And one of the things we had to do for both of these designs is look at the shaft because you can't add that extra weight without considering the shaft. And so we had to do go to our shaft supplier and basically re-engineer the shaft to make it a little heavier and a little stiffer to complement uh, that extra weight in the head. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, it's just fascinating to hear the how the different adjustments that need to be made to make you know the weighting of the putter work because uh, you can't just make the putter heavier and make it longer and then it works right there's all these different kind of components that go into it um but you know the end result is something that that clearly works for you know like you mentioned a lot of the you know lpj tour players are working with something like this already um and on that note too kind of i i have a i have just a curiosity about the tour adoption process and granted this is it's still relatively fresh for you guys um the you know the phantom 2024 line but um have you done any tour adoption with this series yet? And, you know, is there a model or particular uh, setups maybe that are, you know, a lot of tour players tend to gravitate to, or is it just kind of, is it pretty even across the board? Um, how do these models, uh, how are they received among the tour players, both PGA Tour, LPGA Tour, um, wherever they're playing across the globe? Yeah, they've been greatly accepted. I think it's been... Uh, refreshing to us with all the work that we put in to kind of dialing the look and the sound and the feel that we've heard those comments echoed back from all the tour players that have tried this. And I think we've had adoption of all the models uh, across the board uh, on tour in, in, one, in some respect or the other. So both the 11, the nine, the five and the seven have all been and are in play on tour. I think we've seen a little more of our marquee players gravitate towards the five. And okay. so it was great to see you know, Cam Young put uh, a, a Phantom 5 in play when he was using the Phantom X line. Justin Thomas was using uh, almost two generations ago uh, a Phantom 5.5. Uh, he put the new shape in play. As I said earlier, he loved the kind of the compact look, how it swung. Um, and once we dialed his sound and feel in, he likes a little louder sound his. And so we had to do some things to kind of dial it in, but it was easy to dial in for him and we got something that he really likes and he's been playing it for uh, a few months now. Um, and then we had a, 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 another marquee player uh, put a 5.5 play in, uh, in play uh, and won on another competing tour. Um, mm -hmm. And that, that was great to see as well that he was a traditional blade user that went into a, a more of a mallet style putter. Uh, so we've seen adoption from a lot of different aspects of this new line and it's exciting. Yeah, it's actually, it's, it's fascinating that you brought up, uh, someone who is kind of a, you know, a traditional blade player going to a mallet. Cause that's, we actually got a question about that exact thing, uh, submitted via Twitter. We kind of teased our live yesterday, right? We got a couple questions that were submitted and one of them was from Xavier saying, I've used a Newport two putter for years, generally have not had any problems, uh, but is interested in, in uh, potentially upgrading to one of the Phantom models. So what's the transition like going from a blade to one of these Phantom models if I choose to upgrade uh, is the question from Xavier. Well, I think if, if he's a traditional kind of Newport 2 type player, you know, either going to a, a, a Phantom 5 or 5.5, I think is a great transition because those have kind of equally clean looks as, as a Newport 2. 
Um, you've got the uh, alignment indication with the triple dots, but it's a simple, it's got that top line that's going to seem very familiar to him going from a Newport 2. So I would recommend trying a, a 5, or if he wants a little more face awareness like he's having with his uh, Newport 2, the 5.5 would be a great choice. Yeah, it seems like the the kind of the, the 5 and 5.5 are just, if you are maybe a blade player, and you maybe just want a little bit more forgiveness or, you know, kind of a more stability. Is that is that kind of where you would start really any player that's transitioning from a blade st blade type putter? Yeah, either the fives family or the seven family as well. Okay. It has that distinct top line. So either one of them work well. I think if it was a player that wants more of a cleaner look, the five would be better. The seven kind of brings those other tracer alignment lines on there. So if they need a little more alignment help, if they're feeling like their start lines are not where he wants them to be or they want them to be, you may want to go to a seven to get a little more help with alignment to get that face pointed sure. at the target and then bringing it back to square. Sure, sure, yeah. Um, well, Osti, we are kind of getting up uh, on time here. So I do want to uh, thank you. Before we get to this last question that we have here, I do want to thank you for your time. And, um, you know, as I... Yeah, I've mentioned at the beginning, and I'm going to mention it again now for the viewers, uh, whether you're watching it live right now or you're watching it um, you know, at a later time when this is uploaded on our YouTube channel, um, you can schedule a putter fitting at Second Swing. Um, we can dial you in. Any of our master fitters can dial you in for one of the Phantom 2024 models, and uh, you know, you, you'll probably see some uh, increased performance in putting, make, uh, making some more putts, um, and you can probably thank Osti for that as well. So um, this last question here from Jared. Uh, saying if I wanted to upgrade uh, from my Phantom X7 model, um, which of these would you recommend for the easiest change? Uh, is that just going into the, the 7 of the 2024, or would you recommend something else? I would rec recommend going to the 2024 Phantom 7. And so what he'll find in that is, you know, a little more length to those tracer lines on there, a little better inertia, so a little more forgiveness, and a little softer feel. So if he's looking for kind of a softer feel than he's had in the Phantom X, you're going to get that in the uh, and in, in the new Phantom X, and maybe a little more better, more consistent sound as well. I love that. Yeah, that's great. I think because there's clearly some interest here in the Phantom 2024 Potters. Um, we're gonna we're kind of quick on time or short on time. I know I wanted to you know, let you guys, it's a busy time for you guys at Titleist and Scotty Cameron. So I uh, wanted to let you guys kind of get on with your day, but um, Osti, thank you so much for taking the time. And I'll remind viewers again, if you have a, a comment or a question that we, you know, didn't get to, or you want uh, an answer from, uh, leave it in the comments below. Um, and we can actually send them to the team here at Titleist and, and Osti and, and they'll get back to you with, with an answer. But um, once again, Osti, uh, this has been great. And again, all of us here at Second swing, are, uh, we're so excited about the, the Phantom 2024 putters, and um, it's already been great in the fittings. So thank you for your time. We really appreciate it, and it's been great. Thank you. Thanks for the time, and thank you for letting me talk about these great new putters. Thank you.